Are you stressed and filled with anxiety like I am? Maybe in a bit of pain from that car accident you had a few years ago? Well, the sponsor of today's episode, Hempville CBD, has us covered. They have the highest quality products created by chemists and doctors. Hempville carries everything from CBD to THC dispensary grade without those despicable dispensary prices. Order your Delta 8, 9, edibles, and vapes along with the THCA flower and get free shipping when you spend $50 or more at HempvilleCBD.com. Check out the link in the description for more details. Welcome to the Film of Science, the double feature podcast. Join us as we unravel the interwoven experience of the continuous conversation of cinema. Take part in pairing movies with their cursed counterparts, movies that share DNA, or even pairing questionable duos by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash We offer tiers at the $1, $5, and $20 level. For the $5 tier, we grant the ability to request films to further the discussion. So grab some popcorn, sit back, and get ready to join the 100-year conversation. This is the Film of Science, where movies are more than just entertainment there an experience there an experience all around you. You, you and welcome back to another episode of the film of science thank you for joining us today i'm joined today by my hungry friend lucy hello everyone <laughs> wow <laughs> You can join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for brand new episodes of The Film of Steins. Some recent episodes include Nick Cage's new film, Dream Scenario, Christopher Nolan's Inception, The Too Cool for School, Rebel Moon, Part 1, The Creator, and Ridley Scott's new film, Napoleon. Remember to leave nice reviews, comments, thoughts, and ideas over on our Patreon at patreon.com slash and subscribe. Help us out. We appreciate all the support. But today we're discussing J.A. Bayona's Society of the Snow, Netflix's recent big hit. I guess I have to say off the top that I'm really surprised that someone can go from making perhaps the absolute worst Jurassic World movie, Jurassic Park franchise movie with the black market of dinosaurs to one of Netflix's best films, period. You got something to say about that? Well, first of all, it's not that bad. It's not that bad how you're, you're, you're right. saying it right now. It's worse. No. It's not <laughs> Whatever worse. you think it's worse. It's not. It's not that bad. Not for you to say how can he give us that shit and then this masterpiece. No. Not that bad. All right. All right. It sounds like a a ranking is in order with the Jurassic Park and World movies. I didn't know anything about this Uruguayan flight catastrophe. Apparently, everyone knows about it on the internet. I guess maybe after this movie comes out, everyone's like, oh yeah, we all know about this. I missed the memo. You missed the memo. Yeah. All right. So, um, I didn't know anyone was going to survive this. Oh, okay. So, that was a big surprise <laughs> for me. Well, a, f- a handful of people survived. I was actually quite shocked at how many people survived. I guess... I expected everyone to die, not just one or two to survive, but just everyone to perish in a variety of ways. So that was really, I guess, fun as, you know, as far as um, um, a cinematic experience going through that. Yeah, that's interesting. I I mean, I did not live under a rock, although sometimes I crawl under rocks. But this time I did not. And I've, I've always heard about this. I think there's some documentaries out maybe just one documentary i'm not sure and uh several books from the survivors so i i knew there would be survivors but that's interesting whether like not knowing whether they were going to make it or not which it's still a film inspired by these events and nowhere here are they claiming you know a biopic or a documentary so they could still kill everybody and say this is what really should have happened, but here are our survivors. That would be an interesting take. But I guess I did know that there were going to be survivors. But I really loved this movie. I was really surprised by how much I liked it, actually. It was very emotional, but I'm sure a story like this is already very emotional. And you're exploring the human spirit. 
So that alone is very powerful. But our director here just takes a whole different perspective and focuses it on our character Numa here. And I think that just made it a million times better than what anyone could have done with it. And I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed watching it from his perspective. There's not a lot of movies that do that, that give you that give you a narrator who's going to die midway towards the end and you not know that. You know, there's there's a few movies that you kind of already know they're dying and they're like, let me take you through what happened. And then they take you through what happened. Or maybe some kind of animated film where they come back, there's magic involved, there's something involved to where that character gets to come back either as themselves or maybe something like you know an eagle or something but very rare is there a movie where our narrator is the speaker for another situation Mm -hmm. i can tell a lot of care went into this film and a lot of respect for what these survivors went through I really like the angle where Numa is our narrator because it it plays into what another character was saying when he was talking, I think, to Numa about how he doesn't have a god or he doesn't worship like a traditional god that these people who have, you know, died with us, died for us, who work with us and, you know, allow for our survivability are the things that I worship. And then I didn't know Numa was going to be one to die. And so when he does die, I'm just like, oh, wow, he's not like, this isn't a retrospective of, you know, his life when he's older or something. He is this omnipotent, omniscient thing that that guy was talking about. That's kind of maybe the voice in their heads because he kind of was the, or so it seemed, the like literary guy of the group. And so he carries that on, or I should say they each carry him on, at least in this movie, in a similar way that they heard him in, you know, when he was alive. Yeah, and that gets nicely conveyed with the last note he gives them when he says that there's no greater love than to give one life for friends, which goes back to what that guy was saying. Um, These are the people who he worships, the people who gave their strengths for the survivability of the group. And it's very important here that Numa is the last survivor. And that's why he gets to kind of speak for the people that need to be remembered. And I see the potential shortcomings of a film like this. And we face some of that here. Like the feeling of hunger and desperation and the time thing. Those are kind of things that are harder to get across in film. By the nature of film, I think. So I appreciate the singular focus we mostly have on Numa too. It helps kind of reel that in to almost a degree that you're not so worried about the others eating, but when is when is Numa going to eat? And we see him reject eating human flesh, and then we see him give in, of course. And there just makes it makes it a little more personal. We so we kind of we sacrifice the desperation of the group and the hunger of the group. And the trade-off for Numa having to succumb to it. And I, I like that angle. And of course the Link thing, them being out there for like almost 80 fucking days is impossible to get across on in any platform, any kind of medium. Because it's, <laughs> it's just totally indescribable in any form without experiencing it. Yeah. Yeah, which I'm glad they give us the little text telling us how many days have gone by i mean that's really the only thing you can do telling us how many days have gone by how many people or not how many but the people that have died with their age next to it it brings a necessary sterileness to the situation too because they are for the most part kind of just waiting to die yeah and it's just the truly unbelievable thing is that these two guys were able to i don't know if it was two guys in the I think it was. But they were able to travel across the Indies for 10 days and find this cowboy guy and or some kind of civilized person with a vehicle and way of getting in contact with the police and everything. That's even more unbelievable than them 
just surviving out there for two and a half months. That really helps set the tone for what this movie is. It's a survival movie, but it's like a situation where they shouldn't have survived. It's a situation of the will to survive and what humans can do and what they're capable of. What do you think of our intro where we get these young men together to travel the Chile by plane and crazy things happen in the plane? I think that's a nice setup. You know, we see them first interacting with each other as a team. Um, we don't really know the characters then and they don't really look how they look from the beginning of the movie to the end when we really know them. So we we can't exactly pinpoint their personalities, but we know they are a team. We know there's a team captain. We know that they know each other. We know that one of the guys is trying to convince another guy to go with them. So it's it's very nicely set up. People are saying goodbyes to their family. I mean, if you don't know what this movie is in for, that's very heartbreaking really this introduction and then we have like one of the most insane scenes that i've seen in a movie i mean we're seeing everything through numa's perspective he's kind of he kind of notices something's going on you know there's a little bit of turbulence he's looking out the window noticing some just kind of i don't know just something's not right it's like some Final Destination shit. Yeah. And then we have this very, like, beautiful shot of, you know, his eyes, like, very zoomed in. All we see are his eyes. And then he looks up at the sun and he's kind of blinded. And then all hell breaks loose. There's people flying. There's luggage flying. People are screaming. We're seeing people's legs, like, bend and just crack. And then somebody gets impaled in the neck i mean it's 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 insane you know the plane's torn in half i mean it's all so chaotic and we're watching everything through his eyes and we're as terrified as he is and i can just imagine how fun and stressful something like this is to shoot just the way the seats according then when the plane started to skirt across the mountain was just completely insane yeah i i was very curious on how this whole scene was shot because it looked insane there's no other way to put it and apparently there were three sets one of a whole plane one of half a plane and then i think one where later on the plane is half buried in snow so for the um crash sequence they put tiny little wheels on the plane seats and they had one guy push them so that's the accordion effect you were seeing like the guy in the back would be pushing the seats and then there would be actors getting pushed in until you know they couldn't be pushed in anymore and then they would be replaced by dummies and then the dummies were the ones that were like <laughs> face planted and stuff. yeah and he talks about how in post-production they had to go in and take out all the tiny little wheels from the seats and make it look like the seats were actually going in like that. So that was pretty cool. And how they had a lot of dummies on set for not only this scene, but a lot of scenes, which that makes sense. That makes sense. We have <laughs> a lot of bodies. Yeah. A lot of not moving bodies. It's very rare when a movie makes me feel something besides emotion i guess how this movie just makes you feel so cold i like that i don't know if how many other movies i've seen that take place in extreme cold we have end of the world movies that are you know frozen and we had i guess that uh dream sequence in inception where there was ice everywhere and but just i guess you know something about them having to survive and not wearing the adequate equipment one should wear in those extreme temperatures just makes your body so freaking cold. And I like that. That was cool. I had to wrap myself up in a blanket. Yeah, I felt something similar. It's kind of like a the yawning effect. Because they were cool, we were cold. 
or because I was cold, that made you cold, and I was cold because they were cold. The, the combination. <laughs> the combination. It's pretty cool. I don't know if I've seen the opposite, where a movie felt feels so hot. Maybe that Spike Lee movie. Do the right thing. That one, yes. And Twelve Angry Men. And Twelve Angry Men. Yeah, I don't know if I feel it in those movies though. No, not like this. Definitely not like this. So I just thought that was cool. That's something to um, appreciate, really. You made me cry. You made me feel emotion. But you also made me so freaking cold. Yeah, I think that is helped with the singular kind of vision we have with, you know, focusing on Numa. It kind of places us in his shoes a little bit more instead of some objective view. So you think if we would have, if this movie would have been kind of a third person standing off not so personal, not so close. We wouldn't have gotten that cold. Yeah. I also don't think it would have been as good. I agree. Because I know there's another adaptation of this called Alive, I think. And it focuses on the spiritual angle, which we get little hints of here. But I think that's a really weird angle to focus on because that feels very culty because all of a sudden you have this religious motto turn cannibalistic and like that's that's a weird combination that sounds like a horror film yeah <laughs> so this movie you would think you'd want to focus on the desperation survivability camaraderie like they treat the cannibalism like it's a taboo in the movie like they should because that's how they felt or i, I assume that's how they all felt doing it and afterward yeah they worked um Bayona here worked really close with all the survivors. That's awesome. I saw that they had about a hundred hours of footage of interviews with these guys. So I imagine that their tone and mood of the way they talk about it was the entire reason for the singular perspective. Yeah, I can see that. Because this is a moody thing. This isn't, this really can't be a statement piece. This cannot be this dualistic kind of religious versus survivability piece there's it's too real because i guess you know it happened and just the presence of it happening and you trying to adapt it grounds it like nothing else and so you can't it's hard to inject this literary thing in this setting with these characters so i really appreciate the the focus on on Numa, or I should say the focus from Numa's perspective. Yeah. Yeah, and then I like how that morphs, like I said, I liked how that morphs into this omniscientness. Is that the right word, omniscient? I can see why the Alive film would want to focus on that. In an interview with the director, he talked about how really close to around the time when this event happened there were organ transplants happening and he talked a little bit about how um a lot of the people didn't they weren't okay with that with organ transplant you know it was it was a Hmm. a semi new thing and being religious i guess that's not something you do i don't know i'm not i'm not sure you're sure that you're defiling the body you're defiling the body right and, you know, it was just, it was just not okay. So. I've never thought of that being a problem. Hmm. So he, he talked about how he wanted to portray how not okay they were with consuming human flesh. But he does it in a very, I don't know if I want to use the word mature. He, he uses it in a, he makes this conversation that they have in a real. Like a matter of fact kind of way. Like yeah. This is. This is how it's going to be if we want any chance to survive because the filmmaker here, as lo- along with all of our survivors at any point in the film, are completely aware of the desolate nature of where they're at. There's nothing lives up here. Yeah, and it, it helps that we have Roberto saying that because he's, you know, the med student or whatever, even though he only did one year. But he's he's the student and he's the one who's saying that. So, it, yes, it's like a very matter of fact way we will die if we don't eat these and i don't know i've never i don't think i've ever seen a live 
but that just sounds more, you know, horror, more, we gotta consume the human or we'll die yeah. way. And they establish their rationale and logic right out of the gate, too, with how they react to being alive after the crash. They they build a wall, they ration out their food supply. It puts these guys on a strange, like, know-how level, although they've I'm sure they've never been stranded in a place before like this, at least. But they seem to kind of, right out of the gate, understand how like dire the situation is and so they you know one thing leads to another they understand that they have a bunch of food right outside that could give them a chance yeah and i i like that too i like that each of each of our boys here have some kind of thing about them that's gonna help everybody like the mad guy you know marcello was the leader the captain of the team so he quickly started telling people what to do. And then you had the techie guy who could fix the radio and the people that had a way with words and could kind of calm somebody down in a very stressful situation. So I, I like that. I like those little pieces of personality that was given to these boys. It makes me think how different this could have gone if it were maybe like a commercial flight with just random people you know the baby the 10 year old the grandparents the couple on the honeymoon they would have all died (laughs) and then here we have people who know each other they talk to each other they've grown up around each other maybe family cousins and the mom the sister it's more tragic yeah well said The director's favorite scene is actually the scene where they're having that conversation about consuming humans, about eating them. He talks about how he really likes the dynamic and the relationships that all these people have with each other. You know, we have the people who are absolutely refusing to eat human and the people who are like, no, we need to survive. And just kind of looking at your friend who you know is on one side, but you're on the other side and just this tense situation. And then he talks about how in that scene, it ends with one of the boys just bursting out and crying. Yeah, man. So many of those scenes inside the plane were awesome. Those close quarters. Yeah, I think my favorite one is the one where they're all making up poems and just kind of having a good time and... The audience in Numa is, you know, thinking we're we're okay, we're having fun, we're laughing, we're gonna be okay. And then a fucking avalanche happens and they're all stuck in deep snow and people are dying and they need oxygen fast and it's dark and chaotic and that was fucking crazy. Yeah, and then every sequence that come after that, when they were buried, was really cool. Those, that might be my favorite scene too or favorite sequence of them kind of having a good time to things getting worse <laughs> <laughs> really fast really fast and yeah that was that was that was nuts i the one thing that sticks out to me most from that sequence is everyone's yelling looking for their friend looking for mm-hmm. whoever's alive and the guy i don't know his name the man the man that was there with the woman and he kept shouting, you're stepping on her, you're on her, you're stepping on her. And it's dark and, oh my God. It's brutal. It was so brutal. Yeah, and that also is a contender for one of my favorite scenes where the, the man, the older guy, is talking to one of the kids about that situation. About what he had to do to survive and how... I think Numa, yeah. Tragic it was for him because he... Along with everyone else, kind of helped facilitate the death of his wife or girlfriend, whoever that was. Mom, was it his wife? It was his wife. Yeah. Yeah. Because they had kids. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and how he, he was the one standing on her chest. Mm-hmm. So if he moved, and yeah, that was that was crazy. That was, <laughs> that was heartbreaking. There's a lot of moments here that are so heartbreaking in both good and bad ways. Probably all the scenes with the radio... And the information they were getting from the radio. Mm-hmm. 
you know, them finding out that there's a rescue team to them finding out that it stopped, the rescue team ceased. Yeah. To them at the end finding out that the two boys made it and are getting rescued. They're insane. They're so powerful, especially that last one. It's totally, it's, you have to really admire the fact, I think, I mean, it may just be me, but even though this takes place over two and a half months, the film does such a good job placing you in the time and place for these guys that there's some, there's still some element of, you know, empathy there because between every scene or whatever sequence, a few days or weeks go by and you know, just the area, the surrounding area just indicates that they're, they've been doing a bunch of the same for every single one of those days. And so there's just some, there's a weight and dread that just drags this mood down. And it, I think it does it really effectively as, as much as a film or TV show or anything can really do. Cause that time thing is really hard to capture, but I think they actually do a remarkable job here with that. And it helps that, yes, these boys are probably doing a bunch of nothing and waiting around for, waiting to die for yes. weeks for the most part. You know, waiting for someone to really come save them maybe, but so it helps ground it in the the span of time versus something like Napoleon, you know, recovering many more months than just, you know, three months. So that story would have no chance in hell, you know, being told in, really fle- in a fleshed out way. So we needed a different focus. We couldn't focus on napoleon's affairs right right especially because he's moving about you know he's going to austria and prussia and back to france and everything and here we're in a real static place so i think it's really effective in that way do you think they kept the same effectiveness of the time in the end where roberto and nando are going to find somebody and that whole track took about 10 days and then when they got in touch with the guy, um, you know, he's also in the middle of fucking nowhere. Mm-hmm. So yeah. how long is did he have to go to go alert? Yeah, probably not more than a day, I would imagine. But yeah, see, I mean, that's where the film starts to falter a little bit because that felt really fast. That felt super fast. And that is because they were on the move. We We didn't, they were on a hero mission. You know, they were on their final mission. There was no coming back, right? Yeah. So it's a tricky thing, and I I appreciate the decision to really not focus on them when they left, and you know until they arrived with that that cowboy dude, because it's it's really I mean I get it man it's such a frustrating tricky thing to try to capture a span of time where something's happening, you know, because mm-hmm. they're traveling up and down valleys and around and stuff, and that's pretty much the only sequence we get is when they get into the valley of some mountains and stuff and I guess they maybe there's some thing out there in the mountainous areas that people know about valleys that because it kind of looked like there was like a path that way I don't know anything about mountain mountainous valleys and that might indicate water <laughs> yeah water or some kind of geographical certainty for life <laughs> wilderness yeah you know not mountains upon mountains upon mountains yes. kind of thing okay okay they must because that's what it kind of indicated to me. And so, of course, we needed that instant. Like, okay, there's... Is there something? Like, there were, the hope was, you know, they got pretty far out there. And the three of them originally. And then they see these rolling mountains. And they're like, fuck. Like, <laughs> what are we going to do? And then one guy goes back. And so the other guys have food. And then we don't really see them until they hit the valley. And then we don't see them again until they hit the cowboy. Mm-hmm. And so... It unfortunately does kind of suffer from that that time thing. It didn't feel like 10 days. And I I just, I mean, that's going to be, that's a hard equation to figure out for filmmakers. It really is. I have no idea how you could correct that Yeah. without having a series or something where we have a similar kind of mood all the way through. And maybe those last episode and a half focus on those guys traveling kind of thing, you know, out of like 10 episodes or something. You know, it had mm-hmm. to be something like that. But then that's that's a tough thing because, like in The Last of Us, we avoid all of the walking. We hit, we get all the high points, but there's like most of the game is walking, <laughs> and the stories Joel and Ellie share and have with each other. So it's it's tough. Yeah, it's tough. But it, I guess they, 
they navigate around it so quickly and it becomes so it becomes such a happy ending that you're not really stuck on it for long and especially because that out of the 80 days or whatever 10 of them were focused on that so it's it helps navigate us around that dragging on for some weird amount of time so i think he does as good as he possibly could without a show maybe i'm not even sure if that's the correct answer because that's that's hard to capture there's no doubt about it. i do not envy that job try to capture a mundane amount of time on camera for sure that's scary work yeah and there's something to be said too that our narrator is gone i don't want to say almost like it doesn't matter what happens after him but we, we're no longer experiencing the awfulness with him yeah and i think it's pretty cool because i feel like they effectively portray a sense of well this is it you know when numa dies it's like mm -hmm. all right well this especially for someone who doesn't <laughs> fucking know who's if anyone's gonna survive i'm like well this is it this is it for all my boys here they they're not gonna make it back so that that was i don't know if that worked on that level for you but it ended up being really effective for me no it did even though i knew the whole time it was <laughs> They're not going to make it. Shit. It's good filmmaking, man. It's good, good filmmaking. He tricked me. <laughs> and you knew. Good job. And I knew. That's sick. One of my other favorite scenes is when they're getting ready to be picked up. You know, they just heard on the radio that Roberto and Nando made it and are alerting. And there's people on their way to go to go collect them. And they're all trying to comb their hair and putting gel in it and brushing their teeth and there's just some something so kind of sweet and sad about that and then they talk about what are we going to do with all these bones and it's like that sweetness is kind of like oh shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i don't i don't remember what they decided to do with them if they were like fuck it let them see yeah or if they, they hid them i don't remember. i don't think they hid them yeah they just left i don't know what they could really do with them i guess they could cover them in the snow there's almost this feeling of, well, fuck it. We did what we had to do to survive. So, I mean, of course, you know, especially in retrospect, I'm sure they're all ashamed. But in that moment of, you know, like, we're going to make it, I mean, they may not have even crossed their mind, really. I guess they did ask it, and then they were taking photos, and they kind of covered some carcasses and stuff. And yeah, which is also a great line in the film, too, that I like. When Numa says, Tintin insists on taking pictures. I wonder who those pictures are for. I'm like, damn. It's so sad. Do we have any photos? Because it, it looked like they left the camera behind. No, we have photos. They're at the end, right? In the credits. Of them in the mountains? Yes. Yeah, I think that's actually them. Because I, I, from the little bit of catching up I did, they didn't immediately pick everyone up like they did in the movie. They came and got a group of people and then left and then came in and got another group of people damn yeah i know right <laughs> <laughs> that's that's tough so maybe in there they picked up the camera or whatever you know okay so okay can you imagine being part of that second group at least leave some food right right they, I, i'm sure they did i bet you they did and water and everything yeah and blankets mm -hmm. maybe yeah at least a jacket because they may have left someone with them like a, a so-called expert, snow expert, mountain expert. Could have seen that. It's like when you go to, I don't know, like when you go to the YMCA and you need a basketball and they ask you to leave a personal belonging and then you exchange the basketball for your personal belonging. In case you steal the basketball, they have that insurance. Is that what that guy is for? See insurance that they're coming back to get him? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> I did like that when they were high up on the mountain ridge, you couldn't see the plane for shit. And so, you know, there's just there's no fucking chance in them just being randomly spotted. That was awesome. They really do an amazing job isolating these these guys. Yeah, especially in all the scenes where it's a bunch of mountains and tiny little human trekking. You're like, fuck, where's the tail of the plane? <laughs> God knows. 
I guess the last thing I want to talk about is the progression of their bodies slowly becoming thinner and their faces just becoming more frostbitten and dry as fuck. How they do that? Makeup? I don't know. It's pretty amazing. Yes, it looks really good. I know that they filmed in actual snow, which I was surprised. I mean, I guess not that surprised because it looks amazing, but not that I'm an expert at fake snow or, you know, CG, anything, but... Yeah, I I wonder how they kept that up because they must have kept it cold for one, (laughs) but they put snow in like a an arena of screens don't know if you know about this but they here in the last few years there's been productions where they create a like game like landscape with screens that simulate where they're at in whatever show or movie in here the mountainous area right how did they deal with snow on any kind of set level situation well i know they filmed in Sierra Nevada, which is in Spain, a lot of the out in the open shots, you know, I guess the non-plane shots, those were filmed on that snow-covered mountain. And then they laid in shots of the Andes. But as far as the plane stuff goes, yeah, how do you keep wherever you're filming cold enough that your snow's not melting? I know that uh, for the scene where they're all coming out after that blizzard, that they used real snow for that and that the actors were actually submerged in a mix of artificial and real snow and that they had, like, warm blankets ready and, I mean, (laughs) Jesus Christ. I couldn't imagine filming somewhere it's cold. Maybe that's why we got so cold because they actually are cold. They're not pretending to be cold. (laughs) There's something primitive we're connecting on with them. Yeah. We see it in their eyes. That's not a fake shiver. That's a real shiver. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool, though, that you can make something like this look this good, feel this terrible, and still keep the care and respect of what these people went through. Might be my favorite 2024 film. Is it 2024 film? Can I call it that? (laughs) Yeah, I, I don't know. It, of course, released... On Netflix, January 4th. Okay. But it hit theaters all across the world throughout the last part of 2023. Oh, shit. (laughs) So I don't even know what to call it. What does a wiki call it? A 2023 film. Well, wiki might be right. (laughs) I'm probably going to, I'm going to label it as 2023. Ah. All right. Yeah. So. so not my first 2024 no, yeah, we film. Have, I thought it was going to be the first 2024 movie too. Dang. And I mean, also, we didn't say it, but the performances were fucking amazing. And none of these guys, none of these actors were actors before. This is a lot of their debut film. Yeah, it goes to show you if you can just place actors in a situation and direct them and just have some expectation and probably teach them quite a bit i'm sure they were they became very familiar with a lot of the interview uh footage that they collected you can you can get a lot out of you know newbies yeah i know for that scene when they're all reciting their poems um the director talks about how he let them write their own he let them improvise their own poems so i thought that was pretty cool i don't know how often improv happens in films Me being the type of person I am, I would probably not let it happen unless I could trust (laughs) that my actor was a good improv actor. But um, I thought that was cool. Him just saying, improvise based on who your character is. Go. And they had fun and they were very silly and it hit with the movie. Genuine laughter at each other's dumbass (laughs) poems. Yeah, I mean... Improv can be really powerful in movies. It's probably not as common as you'd like to believe it is. It it should be more common. Actors should be able to flex their acting a little more than probably be controlled. And of course, you go after some actors because of what they bring and the chaotic nature they are, like Nick Cage or someone. 
Like you can't control Nick Cage. You know, you give him the script, whatever he wants to do with it, you know, he ends up doing with it. But like you said, there's something real powerful there about having a good director direct you, letting you be what he's taught you to be. Yeah, and especially outfitting the scenario. He's emulating the scenario for you to emulate the the situation. Whoa. <laughs> you know, like more people should try that. Disney should try that. Damn, <laughs> here we go. Instead of having all your green boxes and just fake nonsense, like, you know, try creating some real props. Shot. Fired. That seems like such a cool thing to do, too. Why would you not want to do that? Why would you not want to create something and use it? I don't know. That's just ridiculous that you wouldn't want all these practical effects. Yeah, especially when someone like Disney went from Pirates of the Caribbean where they com- they masterfully combine practical and CG to what they're doing now. I don't even know what they're doing now. Just assume everything you see on screen is CG in the worst way possible cuz I guess you could go down the like the Dune route or Arrival or something. You could get some really nice effects, but Disney insists on making the CG the spectacle. When they're not very good at it. Damn. Got him. Got him. At least stylize it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That was a good talk. Thank you for that. Thank you. This is a great movie coming from a surprising platform, Netflix. They're not the sole producers, production facilitators of this film. We have a surprising director helming it. Very good work. Again, I can't believe you go from working on Jurassic (laughs) World to something like this. That's quite the leap just leave him alone (laughs) i'm sure he looked at that paycheck that jurassic world paycheck and was like all right i'll do it i can uh, respect respect selling out there's nothing wrong with that we gotta watch it again that's what i'm hearing because you are not appreciating that movie is an abomination it is not an abomination per se (laughs) it's not the best jurassic world the jurassic world that focuses on the black market sort of like not even in a fun way but sort of not really focuses on the black market of dinosaur trading it's like this cabal angle of the dinosaur world jurassic world but anyways do you have a budget guess for me my budget guess is 35 million dollars USDs. And that's because he worked on Jurassic World so he can get a little bit of money? Yes. I don't know. I just pulled that number out of nowhere. It looked really good. So I, you know, kind of correlate that with having a little bit of money. I hear that. There weren't a lot of different set designs. Sure. But they at least had three with just the plane, which now that doesn't sound like many. I don't know. I'm going with 35. And it's not... And a, it's a mostly a not an American production, so that helps drag the price down. I get that. Mm-hmm. It's generally cheaper everywhere else in the world. Yes. But you are pretty far off. Fuck. It's about $71 million. $71 million? Yes. All lots right. Of, lots of money. I mean, hopefully they made all that back. Plus, how how is not everyone watching this movie? So we don't know how much it's made at the box office because Netflix does not report the box office because they don't, you know, they don't like sharing money in, money out because they're definitely afraid of everyone finding out that Netflix doesn't make any money. <laughs> Damn. So I would be, I, I bet it'd be safe to assume that they probably didn't make their money back in the box office, like when during like the theatrical run of it. But it does kind of shine on, you know, Netflix because there's not a lot of good things on Netflix, like Netflix made and distributed, right? Right. So that might in turn kind of help change that. It's 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 impossible to know though. So hopefully I hope for the best for everyone involved in Society of the Snow. Yeah, they deserve it. And we might see these guys at the Oscars. <gasps> so over here on Letterbox for some general consensus it says society of the snow is a 4.1 
Oh, that's awesome. That's I, pretty high. I give it a four. Nice. I'm right there with everybody. I am the general consensus, and I give it a four. There you go. I gave it a 3.5. 3.5? All right. Yeah. All right. Because it's, it's not a film that speaks to me on, you know, my level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's an amazing film. Yeah, you would have preferred if they all died. Um. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I gotcha. I it's, gotcha. It's still, I don't think there's, it's the kind of thing, like, if I was writing for an outlet, I'd probably give it a 4, 4.5. I think there's a level of master class in this film that's something to study. Yeah. I mean, really, just from him being so focused on his perspective and how he wanted to tell this story, that elevates this movie. It's a genius vision, totally. And yeah. it helps make the film successful on a level that just probably just wouldn't work as well if it was working on any other, if it was working from any other perspective. I think an objective perspective is a mistake. I think some ethereal divine perspective is a mistake. I think other singular perspectives could have been a mistake, but we focused on a reserved, thoughtful, moody character that helps solidify the dread of it all. So, Yeah, and I think it's also important that we didn't pick a survivor to tell the story either. Yeah, I totally agree. In retrospect, that only elevates the mood yeah, for sure. All right, man. Well, thank you. Thank you guys for listening to this episode of The Film of Steins. Remember, we post every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with brand new episodes of The Film of Steins over on patreon.com slash film of Steins, Spotify, Pandora, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, all the good. And remember to leave nice reviews, comments, thoughts, concerns, ideas over on our Patreon. Come and support us, please. Please. It's cold over here. It's very cold over here. Until next time, though. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that's a wrap for today's episode of The Film of Steins. Thanks for tuning in and joining us on our cinematic journey. We hope you enjoyed our discussion, gained some new insights and perspectives in the world of movies. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform, especially Patreon at patreon.com slash film and follow us on social media for more film-related content. We love hearing from our listeners, so if you have any feedback, suggestions, movie recommendations, or book recommendations, please feel free to reach out to us. Until next time, keep watching and keep loving the magic of movies. This is The Film of Steins. Signing off.